Welcome to the Renaissance and welcome to this edition of the 1914 Amalgamation of Nigeria, A Hoax, Part 2. Here is an important notice. This video is research based. There is no propaganda or any deliberate attempt to distort the truth or the facts of history. You are free to challenge whatever is being said by providing relevant sources of your own side of the narrative. Remember, the truth may be bitter, but like a bitter drug, the patient still needs it. Remember what one of our sisters sold into slavery during the slave trade called Harriet Tubman said, and we quote, I freed a thousand slaves, I could have freed a thousand more if only they knew they were slaves. So it is important that you and all of us understand that someone could be a slave without knowing it. So the moment you realize that you are a slave, the chains of bondage start to fall apart. So let us look at this from a very constructive point of view. Remember they say, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. Have you ever heard that Nigeria was amalgamated in 1914, as in they brought the North and South together, and then that Flora Shaw or Lady Lugard coined the name Nigeria, and that Flora Shaw suggested the name Nigeria in an essay to the Times on 8th January 1897. These are all lies. Do you ever wonder who is behind the lies and why? Why do they teach children lies knowingly? Who creates the Nigerian academic curriculum and their qualifications? Who removed history from the schools in Nigeria? Do you also ever wonder why Africa is poor and starving? Why Africa adopts the posture of a beggar? What and what are behind poverty, wars, suffering and tears in Africa? The lies and deception cause the wars, hunger and starvation in Africa. And we are going to show you how these things are being orchestrated. Let us quickly just recount the lies or the fraud or the deception that Nigeria was named by Flora Shaw in 1914 or in 1897 or any time by looking at this wikipedia page and he tells us that in an essay that first appeared in the times on 8th january 1897 by miss shaw she suggested the name nigeria for the british protectorate on the niger river in his essay shaw made the case for a shorter term that would be used for the agglomeration of pagan and mohammedan states to replace the official title. Your question now should become, if she wrote an essay to a newspaper, whatever it was, who and who now took that paper to implement it? However, before we even go that route, you will notice that this material referenced another material. Let us look at the uh, source of this narrative first. If you looked, you will see that they referenced Omori Omo in 2002 as the source of where um, Flora Shaw or Lady Lugard could have coined or named Nigeria, which is as impossible as it is untrue. So the question becomes, who is behind these lies? Let us show you clearly that these are all lies. Here is the blog they pulled the information from and it's um, a blog by a professor or, or called Omo Omori or something but the question is this is a professor and here is his narrative and look at how he is trying to create a falsehood or a truth from a lie by saying that um, she thought that the term Royal Niger Company Territories was too long to be used as a name of a real estate property under the trading company in that part of Africa. She was right. That has nothing to do with the people in the part of Africa. 
What is important in Flora Shaw's article was that she was in search of a new name and she coined Nigeria in preference to such terms as Central Sudan that was associated with some geographers and travelers. She thought the term Sudan at this time was associated with a territory in the Nile Basin. She then put forward this argument in the Financial Times of London of January 8, 1897 thus. So our interest is to see how this professor has effectively made a complete lie concocted by some semi-illiterates to become near truth. So we're going to show you now that he is lying and he fabricated what he is saying by referencing another book. So if we reference a new universal history of the religious rites, ceremonies and customs of the world, whole world, or a complete and impartial view of all the religions in the various nations of the universe, both ancient and modern, from the creation down to the present time, including the ancient and present state of religion amongst the Jews, Egyptians, Carthaginians, all those things like that, together with the history of the reformed churches listed, uh, like you can see, by William Hurd, D.D., and published 1811. Note the date of publication here, 1811. We see what it tells us. So we see that it says, religion of the inhabitants of Negritia or Nigeria. So if by 1811, before Flora Shaw was even born, there was Nigeria in a book, how possible is it then that she could have coined it? So let's take this one step further to show you that all these things are fabricated lies to deceive the people. Again, we hope that the video is clear enough that you see it clearly written in a document of 1811, Religion of the Inhabitants of Negritia or Nigeria, so that you understand what we are driving at here. If the lies about who coined the name is there, then there couldn't have been any amalgamation because if you notice, what they did was after they discovered that people have seen that the name wasn't coined by Shaw, they changed their narrative from his wife gave the name um, Nigeria to the North and South following the amalgamation to how she now suggested it in 1897. So our challenge to you is to keep a tab on this narrative and you see that very soon they are going to change it to something different. They will come up with some form of lie to buttress their point and still maintain that, oh, it was Flora Shaw that brought it. Let us um, look at Flora, Flora Shaw's own account first. In order to better appreciate these lies and where they are coming from, let us still look at the book we referenced earlier, the same um, book of 1811 that had Nigeria in it to show you how they came up with the concept of a white god. So you see where it says, This day of rest is very strictly observed in the exercise of dancing, etc. And this is likewise their day appointed for the circumcision of their children. There is one of their fetishes, it seems, whom they acknowledge superior to all the rest. When anyone asks them what notion they entertain of the deity, they answer that he is black like themselves and that instead of being their bountiful benefactor, he acts like a tyrant and an oppressor. To these, our historian replied, in the language of a missionary, that God is white like us, is good and gracious and has done great and marvelous things for us, that he descended from heaven to earth for our sakes and was crucified by the Jews for our salvation that after the dissolution of these our earthly tabernacles, our souls shall take their flight to the celestial re regions. The essence of showing you this narrative of how they brainwashed the old people then with the concept of white God is for you to understand that these people are liars. You notice that they also said the people had a day of rest, which is akin to the Shabbat, which they now moved to Sunday and all that. But in order not to digress, let us first look at what um, Flora Shaw herself said about the name Nigeria. That will tell us that 
she had no hand in it and take us to the question of who is behind these lies so if we reference a book written by flora shaw herself the woman being falsely accused as being behind nigeria and the book is called a tropical dependency an outline of the ancient history of the western sudan with an account of the modern settlement of northern nigeria by flora l shaw lady lugard and it was published in 1905 we see what she says about the name nigeria so flora shaw writing in 1905 tells us that nigeria as we call our latest dependency is not properly a name it cannot be found upon a map that is 10 years old it is only an english expression which has been made to, to comprehend a number of native states covering about 500,000 square miles of territory in that part of the world which we call the Western Sudan. Ancient geographers call the same section of Africa sometimes Sudan, sometimes Ethiopia, sometimes Nigritia, sometimes Tekro, sometimes and more often Genoa or Genoa which by the European custom of throwing the accent to the fore part of the world has become Guinea. Sometimes they called it simply Negroland. Always and in every form, their name for it meant the land of the blacks. Genoa, pronounced with a hard G, is a native word signifying black. It is generally used to designate blacks that at the present day among the Arabs of Egypt and the Moors of Morocco, that is applied to the Negroes of the Sudan. From the earliest periods of which we have any knowledge, black land has stretched as it stretches now from the west coast of Africa to the east along that line of successive waterways, which begins with the mouth of the Senegal and ends only at the southern mouth of the Red Sea. So we see it clearly that from her, that is, Lady Lugard herself, she didn't coin any Nigeria. So now that we have established that the, uh, the origin of the name Nigeria is being lied about and it's a fraud and must be deceptive because no one starts lying for no reason. It's either the pe people are born to lie or they have a reason for the lies. So let us now look at their narrative of the alleged amalgamation. If we reference a book called Nigeria, Our Letters Protectorate by Charles Henry Robinson and it was published in 1900, we see the account of the new country created. So we understand that Nigeria existed prior to 1914 and there was never an amalgamation because if there was, there should have been a Lugardian equivalent of the South. If you notice, Lugard was supposedly ruling the North. He had nothing to do with the South. And then all of a sudden, they are telling us that Lugard amalgamated uh, the North and South. So who was ruling the South before Lugard uh, did his fraudulent amalgamation? Allegedly though, because he never said that. So it tells us that the country to which the name Nigeria has been given, and which is chiefly inhabited by the Hausa people, occupies as will be seen by reference to the map about the center of this vast area. Their country does not come within 300 miles of the coast at any point, and they are as distinct as possible from the tribes which are found between them and the sea, reaching from Sierra Leone to the mouth of the Congo. These latter are, many of them, the lowest and most degraded savages to be found anywhere. In illustration of the statement, we may notice the horrible atrocities committed in connection with the fighting which has occurred during the last few years in Dahomey, Ashanti, Benin, and the hinterland of Sierra Leone. So now we have seen that the houses are distinct. They created a country called Nigeria. This book is being written in 1900, and we would imagine that it took the person writing it at least one year to write the book. So let's say he started it in 1899. 
So then we see from Wikipedia the allegation of a so-called amalgamation. We know they are lies, but let us see what it says. It says British Governor Sir Frederick Lugard successfully completed amalgamation of the northern and southern protectorates of Nigeria to form one country. The newly united colony and protectorate were to be presided over by a proconsul who was entitled the Governor General of Nigeria. Although formerly the country's name was derived from the Niger River, some accounts attribute the name of the country to Flora Lady Lugard, wife of the governor. In the letter she wrote to the Times on 8 January, suggested the name as a shortened alternative to Royal Niger Company territories. We have seen that the name appeared in books as far back as 1811. We saw it in books in the 1860s. We saw it in books 1870s, 1890s which proves beyond all reasonable doubts that these people are lying. Now, if you look at the book that gave us um, the account of uh, the new country formed in 1900, it also co told us that the country was formed then. So you see that what they are doing is to use propaganda and lies to tell us that there was some form of amalgamation when there was indeed none. So let us now quickly try to see if we can find out why they are telling these lies. The question should actually be, who are behind the lies? Those, of course, who were behind the slave trade are certainly behind the lies. The slave trade is still going on subliminally. The Europeans, the Arabs, the Fulanese, the Barbers, the Tuaregs, and then the Christians and Muslims. Remember, they must have a reason for lying. So we need to ask, what do they gain from the lies? So if we look here, we see the British um, High Commissioner to Nigeria born around 1962 and then you see them assuring that they will never allow Nigeria to break up. So your question becomes, do these lies have anything to do with one Nigeria? Because when you have one Nigeria, it's actually a, a way of exercising control over everybody to make sure that their own interests are protected over and above the black race. So you notice that no Nigeria can say he is benefiting from Nigeria other than selfishness, whereas the British are the benefactors and which we shall in subsequent editions show you. But let us see what they are playing with in this their um, so-called One Nigeria. Remember, it is the same people that are doing Scottish referendum and Brexit in their own place, but they come in to incite war because their goal is to sell their weapons, nothing more. Let us quickly show you how related these lies are to the slave trade to show you that the slave trade is still very much alive and well but subliminally to the today. That by referencing a book called Fighting the Slave Hunters in Central Africa by Alfred J. Swan and published in 1910, we see this little narrative. You may have been surprised when we say these lies are being concocted and sustained by the Europeans, the Arabs, the Barbers, the Fulanese, and of course the Christians and Muslims. So, but to show you what we mean, this is an account of a slave raid and a slave caravan, which, as we already know, it is the Muslims that were capturing the slaves and selling to the Christians. So now, some um, independent Christians met the caravan, and here is what the Christian asked the Muslim who were conducting the slave caravans to show you what we are talking about. And it says, have you lost many on the road? The slave raider said, yes, numbers have died of hunger. He now asked them, any runaway? And he replied, no, they are too well guarded. Only those who become possessed with the devil try to escape. There is nowhere they could run to if they should go. So now, the reason you don't understand what they are doing is because you think the slave trade was where one man will come and tell another that, look, I have my children for sale. Oh no, we have this one boy or one girl there for sale. That's not true. What you call your Nigerian army today was the slave raiding army. And what you call oil today used to be exactly what slaves were. So they capture and sell to them. This is why you see the Nigerian army celebrating 150 years in 2013. 
all the lies are to cover that track. So let us move one little step further to understand what we are talking about here. So to clearly see that the whole lies are part of this left thread and they are being fabricated and concocted by the British and Americans. Let us show you that or remind you that the conservatives were the same people that branded Nelson Mandela a terrorist for asking for the end of apartheid. Just note that he was labeled a terrorist for doing that. You see how they come in, they want to steal, they also want to be right. Let us take it one step at a time, you see what we're talking about. So we see that even Margaret Thatcher, the then British Prime Minister, labeled Nelson Mandela a terrorist. So you see that this, um, the Nigerian army coming to level IPOB, a terrorist today, is not there. They are minions. These are just lackeys. They don't know what they are doing. They are controlled by the British and Americans because they give them the weapons. Remember, this was how the slave trade was done. You keep hearing African kings sold other Africans, but you notice that they never tell you who that African king is and who has the capacity to capture people to that number. So you see that it is the same slave trade that they are doing subliminally. So now you, you are challenged to go and investigate. The Nigerian army was the same army used to capture and sell the slaves, exactly like oil today. And they sold them for nonsense. Today, do they not sell oil for colored paper? Whether you believe it or not, co uh, uh, dollar is colored paper. You may not believe it, but that's the truth of the matter. So now, let us quickly look at um, the African slave trade and its remedy. It was published in 1840. We see where Biafra sovereignty was ceded to the British in return for ending the slave trade. But to see how treacherous the British are, they are busy using the same system today to see how they can incite war because they are a people that enjoy crisis, they enjoy violence, and they hate truth. Look at it. So here it tells us that treaties with the King of Bulola and Biafra made by Samuel Campbell cede the sovereignty of those districts and the right on the part of Great Britain to establish forts or factories with clauses for the abolition of the slave trade. So you can see what is happening but it's the same people that their ambassador is going about today telling you why there must be one Nigeria. Don't get this mixed up. The only reason they want one Nigeria is to continue their subjugation and slavery. If you don't understand it, if you go and read back in time and history, you will see that one Nigeria benefits the Europeans and Americans. And if you don't understand how they use the slave trade to their advantage, they sell the weapons, they depopulate the place. So they keep the population of blacks and negroes in check. Now compare how the British declared Nelson Mandela a terrorist for asking for um, an end to apartheid with how the Nigerian army declared IPOB and Indian terrorists simply for asking for self-determination, for asking for the schools and roads in the southeast and south-south to be built or allow them to build it. This is how you understand how they work. The British understand the way and manner of these people. They are behind the curriculum and the lies. They choose what they teach the army. The army does not know its duties. Remember, most of these people did not go to any formal school. They take them into the uh, academy and brainwash them with what they want them to think. That is why the same army they used during the slave trade, they are using them today. It was the same way they used them. The only difference between the army today and the army when it was a slave raiding army was then they didn't have uniforms. Today they do. So all they use them to do is to create chaos, to make sure that the country doesn't move forward. There is hunger in the land. It is that hunger in the land that replaces setting fire to their buildings. So they, when the Negroes rush out, they are captured and yoked and sold as slaves. So today, when they make you hungry, keep the country in perpetual turmoil, they are able to sell their weapons. They are able to use the army to kill people. They are also able to force you out of your natural home, out of your natural environment to come and become slaves and laborers in their own country. 
Because when you go to Europe and America, believe it or not, you are looking for greener pastures. Sometimes you are working as a security guard. You are working as a, a cleaner. You are working as anything, including even if you are a nurse or a neurosurgeon, you are still a slave because whatever thing you are doing for them, you could have done back home. So they also try to um, create order from chaos. First, they created the chaos, then they try to create order. So you notice that it is the same difficulty and economic challenges and hardship that is forcing people to try to migrate from the desert, to try to go through the ocean, the Mediterranean, to reach Europe. Now tell us, do you think all the presidents in Africa do not see the, the problems being faced by, by their own people? So why do you think none of them is doing anything about it? This was exactly how the slave trade happened. Many humanitarians and other organizations in Europe and America were against the slave trade. But the British and Americans, Europeans, and Muslims and Christians pretended not to see what was going on. Your question should actually be, when somebody like, um, let's say in Nigeria, you have a president, and he claims that, oh, he's doing this and doing that, and in two, three, four years, each year he has budgeted, let's say, six billion dollars as his budget. Do you spend time to ask yourself, where did this money go? The essence you need, uh, of this presentation is to tell you why they are lying there was nothing like an amalgamation they just have to find a story to tell you a lie to tell you a lie to make you believe whatever they are saying now if your people are drowning in the ocean your brothers are dying in the desert is scorching heat in search of food can you tell us why this government or that government whichever country you're from in sub-saharan africa does not have enough money to give those people if you think the problem is not those governments, why do you think the British that is conducting Scottish referendum, conducting Brexit, is busy inciting wars there, agitating and demanding that one Nigeria remains one and all that. But it is them people that ceded Bakasi to Cameroon. So their interest is however they can create war so that the foolish people they have there as rulers can use their weapons. Great chaos and you keep rushing out. Many die in the ocean, many die in the desert. That's just what they are doing. If you still have any doubts about what we have said here, there was no such thing as amalgamation. They just come up with stories. They are still on their slave trade match, which is what they are doing till tomorrow. At least the mere fact that you watched that Nelson Mandela was labeled a terrorist for asking for liberty. That's all. Freedom. That should tell you what the army is doing today because the army is completely and totally controlled by the British. If you think it is Nigerian army controlled by Nigerians, you are wasting your time. Because if you notice, the Nigerian army does not fight any external aggressor. It only fights its own citizens, civilians, which was exactly what it was created for. Then it used to be used to capture and sell the slaves. That's the only thing it does. But today, they just gave them a uniform to do it officially. We thank you very much for listening and we recommend that you do your own research about whatever we have said. And we challenge you to come up with wherever we have lied. If you think there is anything we have said here that is inaccurate, please feel free to challenge it. No um, post will be censored. You won't be um, banned. We will welcome all your comments as we will debunk them whichever way you come from we are willing and ready to do it based on research there is no propaganda here all we are looking for is for the well-being of africans we have suffered enough in the hands of these people the resources they buy they buy with colored paper thank you very much once again for listening and please remember to conduct your own research shalom